today, there are 50 ongoing armed conflicts around the world. There are also a countless number of personal disputes happening around the clock. And so now, with all this conflict, we must ask ourselves, what can we do to resolve them? So everyone at some point in their lives will experience conflict, whether it be at school, at home, or unfortunately on the battlefield, conflict is inevitable. And we don't always know how or when this conflict is going to arise. But one thing I do know is that I have certainly seen many sides to conflict. My mother is a mental health clinician in two different schools. And as a part of her job, she helps a variety of students with a variety of issues. She's heard about bad family situations, anger issues, and even domestic and sexual abuse. And through her expertise, I've been able to learn a lot about the world of interpersonal conflict. My dad is a West Point educated lieutenant colonel for the US Army. And through him, I've been able to learn about global conflict, conflict in the Middle East, civil unrest, and even the general concept of war. And global conflict came knocking on my door in third grade when my dad was deployed to the Middle East for two years. And at the end of these two years, my parents decided that they no longer wanted to stay together. They wanted a divorce. And it's hard as a young kid to see your parents fighting. It's hard to see them barely be able to stand in a room together. I can remember thinking, why do they have to fight? Why are things changing? Why can't they be like they were before? And as a third grader with a whole three years of education under my belt, I thought to myself, why can't they just sit down and talk it out? Why can't they come to some solution instead of just fighting with one another? I mean, that's what we tell our kids, right? If, imagine now we have Sally and Jack. They're on the playground playing together. And then for whatever reason, Sally decides to steal Jack's toy. <laughs> and so Jack gets mad, so he pulls Sally's hair. And then Sally decides to throw sand in Jack's face. And suddenly, it's Mayweather and Pacquiao out on the <laughs> in the sandbox. And so what do we do with this? Obviously, we can't just let them fight it out. We can't let one RKO the other. <laughs> so we stop the fight. We ask them to sit down and to talk with one another. And we tell them to listen and to understand where the other's coming from and what they can do to compromise and come to a solution. And the thing is, is from a young age, we're taught all the proper steps for conflict resolution, the three vital components, you can call them. We do learn to empathize, we learn to listen, and we learn to de-escalate the situation. But the problem is, is somehow, we seem to forget this once we're adults. We don't listen nearly as much as we should, we don't empathize like we used to, and we certainly forget to de-escalate the situation. And the problem is, is once we're adults, Small dis uh, the, the playground turns into the big world, where small disputes have the possibility of turning into world wars. And the thing is, is we have the power to stop things before they unravel. And we have the power to stop things even after horrible things have happened. For example, let's look at the Cold War. During the Cold uh, after World War II, the US and Soviets were interlocked in a battle. Not a physical battle, but a battle of words. They both had desires for economic gain, for territorial control, and global power. They also had a sharp cultural division between the two. And tensions were never, uh, both were also armed with nuclear weapons, and they were in a nuclear standoff. And tensions were never higher than during the 13-day period known as the Cuban Missile Crisis. After, in 1961, after the Cuba elected a new communist government, the U.S. tried to overthrow it in a failed attempt. And this prompted the Cubans to ask for help from uh, fellow communist Soviet Russia. And the Soviet premier at the time, Nikita Khrushchev, jumped at the opportunity to help the Cubans because of their strategic position. And so Khrushchev launched, uh, sent hundreds of nuclear weapons to Cuba secretly unbeknownst to the U.S. And by the time the U.S. Uh, 
realize what happened? Hundreds of nukes were poised and ready to strike at a button's push in, the US, uh, in Cuba. And at this point, once the US military leaders realized what had happened, they recommended airstrikes of all the bases and a complete invasion of Cuba. And in a desperate attempt to stop a full-out war between the US, Cuba, and Soviet Russia, Kennedy decided to pull one last little trump card. He decided to put Cuba under quarantine. In effect, he blocked all shipments in and out of Cuba, except for necessary goods. But the Soviets didn't like this very much. They perceived this as an act of aggression. And in a personal letter to Kennedy, Khrushchev wrote, the Soviet government considers that the violation of the freedom to use international waters and international airspace is an act of aggression, which pushes mankind towards the abyss of a world nuclear missile war. And by the fall of 62, tensions were there at, at their absolute highest. The Soviets and the Americans hated each other. But do you know what they were missing in all of this? They didn't listen to one another. They weren't empathizing with one another. And they certainly weren't hoping to de-escalate the situation. But Kennedy and Khrushchev, being the great leaders that they were at the time, they understood this. And so they set up a secret meeting between the Soviets and the Americans in which intense negotiations took place. And at the end of this, the US and Russia came to, an, uh, came to a solution. The US pulled out all the nukes from Italy and from Turkey, and the Soviets did the same in Cuba. In the end, this signaled the end of the Cuban Missile Crisis, and in fact, the end of the Cold War. And even though they avoided the complete destruction of their countries, Kennedy and Khrushchev were crucified by the media when they got back home to their home countries. And this was because they were labeled traitors for negotiating with the enemy, even though it was the only option for them. And it is only because of their ability as leaders to negotiate and to come to an understanding that we are even here today. So now, what made their negotiations so different from, what we, from how we negotiate today? Like Sally and Jack, they use the same techniques, the techniques that we all use and all learn in kindergarten. They understood that they had to listen to one another, they had to empathize, and that they had to de-escalate the situation. And, but the thing is, is during the Cold War, people even suspected of being communists in the US were run out of towns, and they were even put into prison. This us versus them mentality was a dangerous mentality to have because it was only eventually through their understanding and their development of basic empathy that the US and Russia were able to negotiate at all. And Khrushchev realized this, and in the letter that he wrote to Kennedy, he said, when you confront us with such conditions, try to put yourself in our place and consider how the US, uh, the United States, would react to these conditions. And this caused the US military leaders to step into the shoes of the Russians, to understand their point of view, and it encouraged basic empathy between the two groups. But in addition to this, they also had the consequences of their actions to listen to, to realize. They had to bear the brute of anything they did, whether it be a ballistic missile or a nuclear missile, they had something coming back at them. And this applies to everyday conflict as well. In everyday conflict, you have to bear uh, the consequences of your own actions. And these consequences can be ugly. They can be Anything from hurting a friend, angering a coworker, or even losing a girlfriend. But the thing is, is through our empathy, we can better negotiate because we understand that these opponents of ours aren't really opponents, but they're other humans with their own responsibilities and emotions. And with this, we can understand how they feel and why they feel so strongly about their position. It also takes a lot of listening to negotiate. As we saw with Sally and Jack, 
when they sat down and talked, they were able to tell their side of the story. And they were able to explain where they wanted to go with it, how they wanted to resolve the solution, uh, come to a solution. Kennedy and Khrushchev, they also understood this. And because, uh, despite their political backlash, they wanted to come to a solution together. They listened to one another because they knew it was the only way. And in the end, their agreement, because they listened, was able to incorporate the ideas of Russia, the Americans, and the Cubans. And no one was left out to dry. And this applies to any conflict. Because by listening, you can understand, you can empathize more with, your, uh, with the other person, but you can also compromise better, and you can pave a way towards a compromised solution. And neither of these things, you can't empathize, and you also can't listen unless you're willing to de-escalate the situation. Because as I saw with Sally and Jack, the only reason they ever started to talk was because they stopped throwing sand at one another. And the same applies to the Soviets and the Americans, because the only reason they were able to ever come to the table is because both decided to not escalate the situation. Had either power continued to instigate the other, tensions would have only risen, and the whole thing eventually would have boiled over. And basically, the fate of the war, the fate of the Cold War, rested on, upon the fact that neither country decided to launch a nuclear strike. Be and in the end, the Cold War only ended because they were able to show an ultimate level of de-escalation by removing their advanced missile systems. And that's how we end a conflict. That's how we resolve it, by completely de-escalating it. And the problem is, to, is today, we seem to not want to do any of this. But the especially in global conflict. But the Cuban Missile Crisis shows us that we can negotiate and we can come to resolutions together. But today, as I said, that's very unusual. Today we think we can only negotiate with our friends. We think that we need to impose unconditional surrender upon our enemies, and no one surrenders unconditionally unless they're fully defeated. And that's the worst way of thinking. Because not only does it not help promote a solution, it promotes conflict instead. It makes us want to destroy our enemy completely, and, leave, and it leaves a dis, uh, destructive wake in our path. And again, like I said before, there are 50 ongoing armed conflicts today. There's the Gaza Strip, there's the Syrian Revolution, there's Gilets Jaunes in Paris, and the South China Sea conflict between the U.S. and China. And just to pick on this example specifically, but between the U.S. and China, it's very reminiscent of the Cold War. Again, we see two nuclear powers at odds, both with a desire for economic gain, territorial control, and global power. And in any conflict between the two, it'd be disastrous. In an economic fallout between the two countries, it has the potential to start a chain reaction to collapse the world economy. In a military battle between the two, uh, it would completely destabilize the Asiatic region, and it could also end or lead to a nuclear war. Basically, in any conflict between the two, not only does neither the US or China benefit, but in fact, the whole world loses. And so, not only for high-stakes conflicts, like conflicts between the U.S. and China, but even for personal disputes, we now have to understand that reaching resolutions before things unravel is hugely beneficial. Because this way we're able to build stronger and better relationships with our fellow human, with our fellow man, our fellow woman. And so, keeping in mind the ideas of LED, listening, empathy, and de-escalation, we can improve our personal lives and build towards a better future. But I'll be the first to admit, it won't always be easy. In fact, most of the time, it's going to be very difficult. But the thing is, is that this is the best option we have. Because anything else leads to more conflict, to more pain, to more suffering. 
And as it was put by the son of Nikita Khrushchev, the greatest lesson to come out of the Cold War is that you have to negotiate with your enemy. Because if you negotiate with your enemy, there's a good chance that you'll come to some conclusion that will satisfy both sides. And so now, I want everyone in the audience to go out in their lives and incorporate the ideas of listening more, empathizing more, and to always try to de-escalate the, uh, the situation. Because if we do this, we can build better personal lives. We can also build towards a more peaceful and cooperative world. Thank you.